Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I'm not going to wear a mask, but I did just take a test and I'm negative. So, yeah. <laughs> um, OK, uh, yeah, uh, thank you for inviting me to talk about this. Um, I feel like my talk might be slightly different to um, to what we've heard about so far, if only in terms of like the mass scale. Um, so I'm going to start with some like motivations just to kind of set up how, how I think about action like particles. So if we expect there to be new BSM physics, um, then if it has a spontaneously broken approximate global symmetry, then it can produce light spinless particles. The analogy is just the, the pions of QCD, um, which are pseudo Goldstone bosons of an approximate chiral symmetry, and therefore they end up being rather lighter than, um, than lambda QCD, which is where the proton and the neutron live. And likewise, if we think about any kind of BSM physics, which has a general mass scale somewhere above the TeV scale, since we haven't seen it yet, um, then, uh, then we could still possibly get an idea that it's there by, um, by hoping that it's produced some of these light spinless particles. Um, and of course, there are many motivated explicit models um, that you can focus on in turn. Um, but instead of focusing on specific models, another kind of motivation for me is that, you know, if we're looking for um, new physics beyond the standard model, then there are only a few options, really. At least we might be missing the sound outside. What's that mean? So you, um, you can't hear me? Is that is that what you're saying? I mean, maybe me asking that is not going to work. Okay. 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 All right. So, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Sounds like sounds like people can hear me. Um, yeah. So so then there's only a few options, at least in terms of like the effective field theories that you might be thinking about. Um, okay, I don't know how to get rid of all of this now. Does it just disappear? Okay, never mind. It doesn't matter. Um, yeah, you can still see, right? Um, so yeah, so um, the the options are basically either um, either all new physics is heavy. Um, at which point you can use an effective field theory like the standard model effective field theory where you just look at um, at the effects of heavy new physics um, on um, on interactions of standard model particles. Um, or there could be one or more light new particles and they basically have to be um, gauge singlets, at which point the only thing that um, that distinguishes them is their spin. And so, you know, um, if you if you want to sort of go through all of the options, then you can just look at the EFTs of each one of these in turn. And at spin zero, um, the ALP is a good sort of test case. Um, so if uh, if you're being kind of completely agnostic about where this ALP comes from, then it can have a whole range of mass and it can have a whole range of couplings and it's going to have a lot of different pheno. Um, and in particular, it's going to um, decay um, in ways that depend mostly on its mass, but also a bit on its couplings. Oh, nope. Ah, I see. That's probably the pointer. Yes. Um, uh, so yeah. So as soon as it's as soon as it sort of can, it well at any mass basically, it can decay into gamma gamma. It's just about how how long its decay rate how long its um decay length is um as soon as it's heavier than the electron it can decay into leptons as soon as it's heavier than three pions it can decay into hadrons and um and at some point when it's uh you know order 100 gv it can decay into gamma z um and i've put a kind of very schematic line here where you know if you think about producing it 
um, at a collider experiment or somewhere where you have a detector, um, then, it, then in some areas of the parameter space, it's going to be prompt and in some areas it's going to be long lived and, and escape the detector. Um, and then uh, the way of producing it are also going to depend on the mass. Um, so for, for like um, Alps less than about one MeV, um, you have light shining through walls and you have astrophysics. Um, but once you get a bit uh, heavier, you have to start producing it in, in sort of essentially colliders. So beam dumps, uh, decays of heavy mesons or leptons, um, decays of Higgs's or Z's, or, or just directly producing it at colliders if it's heavier than any standard model particle. Um, so in order to study this kind of full uh, parameter space, uh, we don't need to know the details of the UV physics, we can, um, we can work with an effective field theory. So, um, so we just need to follow the rules of effective field theories. The particle content is always going to be the standard model particles plus the axion like particle. Um, and then we can just write down every possible interaction um, that is invariant under the symmetries of the theory. So that being essentially whatever standard model gauge symmetries are appropriate at the scale that you care about. Um, and, um, and ALP rules. So at the ALP is a pseudoscalar and, it, and it's invariant under a shift symmetry, which is broken only by the ALP mass term. Um, and so the exact form of the effective field theory is going to depend on the scale. So if you're above the electroweak scale, um, then you need your effective field theory to be invariant under the full standard model gauge group. Um, below the electroweak scale, it's only invariant under uh, color and uh, electromagnetism. And once you're below the QCD scale, um, then you can start um, thinking about, you know, the, the, the states are no longer quarks, they're um, hadrons. Uh, so you need something like uh, chiral perturbation theory which of course comes with its own set of symmetries that you care about. Uh, so I'm gonna talk sort of about all of these. Um, and, and, you know, one, one thing to remember is that this, this ALP is always going to come from some high scale. Like you're imagining that whatever is generating, it has to be above the electroweak scale. So whatever couplings you have at whatever scale, you know, you have, it has to be consistent with the fact that it came from a gauge invariant theory. Um, so SU2L invariant basically. Um, and then uh, once you've sort of decided what couplings you, your model has, um, you need to make connections with the observables out of dif different scales. So running and matching through all of these effective field theories to where you need to get to. Um, and I'm going to focus on um, ALPs in the MEV to GEV mass range, um, just because below an MEV, um, you, you're, you're strongly constrained by ASTRO, so there's very little that you might want to say with other experiments. Yes? Sure, but you still need to um, you still need to calculate at the appropriate scale, right? So um, you still need to do the renormalization group equations. You still need to work out what. Um, variables to confront experiments would, and so forth. I would tend to agree with you, but even if you have a UV theory, it's easier to do the running in an EFT, right? I see, yes. Um, and also, like, I'm not sure that I've, I mean, when we talk about axions and Alps, it's always suppressed by F, right? It's always, it, I, I mean, it's always an EFT. True, but we know the coefficient in front. That's sure, but it's I'm still saying. an EFT. I agree, but uh, <laughs> I know the number. Uh, okay. Because I have a UV theory. So uh, sure. Uh, yeah. So what in, in, in any particular model you can put particular values of the Wilson coefficients. Right. I, I agree. 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 Thank you. Um okay, but uh but in general, um your your EFT um you 
you have um, the ALP standard model couplings beginning at dimension five. So here we're above the electroweak scale. So um, the couplings to fermions, for example, the fermions are the, you know, the quark doublets, the right-handed quarks, the lepton doublet, and the uh, right-handed electrons. And for the couplings to uh, gauge bosons, uh, we have um, gluons, and then we have, you know, the, the SU2 and the U1 gauge bosons. Um, and if you want, you can write these as, you know, photons and Zs like this, um, but you still have, you have basically above the electric scale, you have three couplings, but only two, like only two underlying co coefficients. So only CWW and CBB. Um, so if you're thinking about the, the, the couplings to photons and Zs, then there's going to be some, um, they're, not, they're not all completely um, independent. So yeah, so now um, with this effect field theory, the, the ALP pheno depends on just the parameters of this theory. Uh, so the, the mass, which in general is free, the, um, this um, decay constant F and, and each of these coefficients, and in particular, the, um, the couplings to uh, fermions are Hermitian matrices in flavor space. So in general, you can have uh, flavor changing interactions. And of course, in the spirit of EFTs, um, this, these are not the only interactions. You also have a series of higher dimensional operators. Um, and so at dimension five, you get all of this kind of leading order ALP pheno. At dimension six, you're mostly back to the SMEFT, meaning that nearly all of the operators at dimension six are just composed of standard model fields um, and don't have the ALP in at all. Um, but they are still part of this kind of ALP effective field theory. Um, the only extra um, operator you get at dimension six is this kind of two Higgs, um, two ALP um, operator. And then of course at dimension seven, um, you get a lot more ALP interactions again, dimension eight, blah, blah, blah. You know, you might not care about those things, um, but they are always there. Um, okay, so, um, so, in this um, in this effect field theory, it's very important to understand the running because you know you might set your uh, your couplings at the high scale by whatever model you have, but those aren't going to be the same couplings that you get at the electroweak scale or even below. Um, so, in order to understand the full phenomenology that you get, you need to um, go to the right scale. Um, and so, this is the uh, one loop renormalization group equation um, for uh, well, so we start off with the um, uh, bosonic interactions. These don't run. It's just a kind of non-renormalization theorem. Um, but the, uh, the couplings to fermions do run. Uh, so here I've got the, the um, RGEs for the couplings to left-handed quark doublets and to right-handed quarks. Um, the, the lepton couplings, of course, also run, but I haven't written them here. They're kind of you know, uh, analogous, uh, but obviously without like gluons and stuff. Um, and um, and the, the kind of pieces that you get are um, pieces from the Yukawa interactions, which are through like diagrams like this, which end up um, in these green boxes. These are important because you can get flavor changing effects out of flavor diagonal interactions, especially if you start off with some coupling involving the top, because the top Yukawa is large. Um, then you've got this weird uh, diagram. So this actually gives you a sort of a um, out coupling to, uh, to two Higgses, which is an operator that isn't in your basis. It's a redundant operator. But once you rotate it back into the basis, it gives you um, a piece which, which is basically couplings to all fermions, diagonal couplings to all fermions. Um, and um, uh, yeah, and you end up with a piece that's, that's the trace over, um, uh, the, you get the trace over top Yukawa's basically. So, so if you start off with a coupling involving the top, 
then you inevitably generate large, uh, like large couplings to all other uh, fermions. And this is important because, you know, if you start off with only quark couplings, you're still going to get electron couplings, even if you try to avoid them. Um, and, uh, and finally, there's sort of um, gauge boson pieces, which again give you pieces that are proportional to um, uh, flavor diagonal um, pieces. So all of that is a lot of equations. So I've done a kind of summary. Uh, so this is a kind of example. So if you start off with flavor diagonal quark couplings, especially to tops, then you're going to get flavor changing quark couplings. Um, if you start off with couplings to gauge bosons, you're going to get flavor diagonal fermion couplings. And likewise, if you have flavor diagonal fermion couplings, you're going to get all other flavor diagonal fermion couplings. So, and, you know, if you're running over a large enough So there is a paper which claims that uh, the coupling to gauge bosons is not given by the pyrrole anomaly and it runs by KV Yon and uh, Smith. Uh, do you know this paper? You can comment because I think they say that uh, in the case of say W or Z, you actually, the coupling to axions is determined by, uh, uh, not not determined by the chiral anomaly. So this is their statement. So then I would suspect that it should run also. Um, right, no, I don't really know that paper. I mean, you can, yeah, I, I don't really know that paper, but, um, but, but I mean, we did the calculation then we found zero. Okay, yes, thank, <laughs> thank you. I just wanted to know your opinion. Yeah. Um, yeah, but I, but I think, I think, I think I maybe, I maybe understand where you're coming from because like the, the, the sort of arguments for the non-renormalization, they do sort of rely on, 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 on this, but yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but actually if you, if you calculate it, it's zero anyway. So yeah. Um, can I make a comment? I mean, the, the mass eigen state of the axion, if you, if you're talking about the axion is by definition is a pseudo Wollstone boson. Sure. So it doesn't couple to GG dual when you when you rotate to the mass eigen basis where, where, with 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 the uh, you know uh, with the mixing with the eta eta meson. So uh, so in mass eigen states it, it's not anomalous things which uh, which which the physical state in in and out states. You're saying that the out doesn't. Uh, this is this is concerns about the axon. I mean, if you're you know. Uh, so I mean, once it, yeah, I mean you it can couple to the non-anomalous current. You can rotate away the GG jewel if that's what you're meaning. I don't. Yeah, but that rotation means that you have a mixing with the eta prime. Okay. And in that basis, in the mass eigen state basis, it doesn't couple to the GG jewel. Okay. It's not anomalous. It's a pseudo Wollstone boson, not not uh, not like a. <laughs> yeah. I have a different question from a few slides ago. I just what. So you you allow yourself this bare mass, but why then don't you also have like a bare self interaction, like an A to the fourth term? I guess you might expect that to appear also. If you have like a, you know, some instantons or something which generate the mass, it might be like some cosine potential. Now you expand it out and you might expect some self interaction. Would that be important or not? Would it affect the RGE? Um, so you do get some pieces in the RGE that are proportional to the mass. You can, if you, if you sort of allow that, and that can give you kind of contributions to, to non-shift invariant operators. But as long as you assume that the mass is small, you know, smaller than the electroweak scale, then it's not normally important. Yeah, I, th like, I think that's. I guess I'm asking about the self interactions, which you might expect to be proportional to the mass, but you also showed going all the way up to, you know, uh, above 100 GeV. So in that case, I might expect the self interactions to affect. So I mean, like an A to the fourth term, which you might expect to be proportional to mass if it comes from some non perturbative thing which is generating the mass. But wouldn't that then affect the RGEs, maybe? 
um so i'm not sure because like you know in this in this case we're only thinking about the things that that are, are sort of suppressed by just one power of f you know it's uh it's just uh, it's just the ALP coupling. Each of these diagrams only has one ALP in them. Uh -huh. um, so I feel like if you have more ALPs, you're going to be at a higher dimensional operator, but I'm not, I'm not sure. Okay. Okay, that makes sense. Um, right, okay. Yeah, and, and if, you, if you sort of, um, if you're running over a large enough scale, which, you know, you might be, <laughs> um, then you know you 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 kind of need to resum the large logs, and you can basically have essentially multiple hops. So you know if you start off with uh, if you start off with a coupling to gluons, then you're going to get a coupling to tops, and then you're going to get flavor changing couplings, or you're going to get electron couplings. So it's difficult over a large separation of scales to suppress any particular coupling. You're going to get them all. I mean, this is the this is kind of the spirit of effective field theories, right? You write down everything that can happen because in general it will. Um, okay, and then um, if we're continuing down through the scales, then we need to do the matching at the electroweak scale. Um, this involves just integrating out the top, the W, the Z, and the Higgs. Um, so below the electroweak scale, you no longer have couplings to electroweak gauge bosons. You've just got um, photons and gluons. And um, and your your kind of um, your fermions kind of change form. You no longer have doublets, etc. Um, you don't get any loop matching contribution. Yeah. Is there any assumption? What is this mass scale which you write explicitly? Here. No, no, no. Mass. Ma like the this map. one? Yes. No. Um, I mean, I mean, here, I guess, um, if you're sort of continuing down, you're assuming that it's le lighter than the electroweak scale. So if you are considering that this is the axiom and yeah. that mass scale is lighter than electroweak. Yeah. Then it means it can it cannot be hard mass and it should come from some, some sector, right? So some young mill sector, because then this particle is still axion, it should still maintain shift invariance. It is, it is shift invariant. No, it's, it's not. If Apart you write down hard mass, it's yeah, not. Yeah, sorry. This is, this is the one term that is, is breaking the shift invariant. Right. So it, it should break from some young mill sector or gravitational topological susceptibility, whatever. But if you consider that it is light, then at this level of treatment, you should include that topological susceptibility explicitly there as well. If you consider that that mass is bigger than, for instance, it's you consider it's same, let's say it's order by order of magnitude same as your cutoff, then you can simply integrate out that field and only thing what you will it will give, it will give mixing between topological susceptibilities, right? Yes, so, and this is still this is still lighter than than the things we're integrating out. Then it means you are keeping topological susceptibility of extra sector because you cannot write hard mass if you want to consider this as an axiom, right? Or axiom like like particle. So you, then you should have extra sector which has topological susceptibility. I mean, I I don't know, like you know, if I'm thinking about it just as a pseudo Goldstone boson, I can I can just have a approximate broken symmetry and, and no you can't you, you can't it should be exact statement so that mass sh should be for some, some three form let's say chance i must three form if that is very heavy okay then you can write down in approximation like mass squared you can integrate over that and you should integrate out completely axiom if not if you are keeping that then you should explicitly keep this chance I must reform because it's same order as the other terms. So that's why I'm asking. Okay, yeah, I, I, I don't think I really understand. I mean, yeah, I don't think I really understand. Like if you, if you have just, if you just think, I mean, yeah, I, I think maybe I need to. Well, let's discuss then after. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, so, uh yeah so you get you get no contributions to um 
no extra co matching contributions to the gauge coupling, or at least if you do, they're suppressed by um, m alp squared over m top squared, etc. Um, but you do get extra contributions to the fermionic coupling, which give you some kind of finite pieces to your flavor changing parts, for example. Um, right, and then and then we need to run below the electroweak scale. Um, here we only have things from diagrams involving photons and gluons. There were a lot of um, pieces above the electroweak scale that where the top Yukawa mattered, but now there is no top Yukawa, um, so it's all a bit um, uninteresting. So yeah, so overall the most important qualitative RG effects, by which I mean you sort of generate qualitatively new couplings, happen above the electroweak scale. Um, and um, for the QCD axion, they can affect um, pheno bounds and model discrimination. There's been a few uh, papers on this. Um, right, okay, so just as an example, um, these are some plots from this, uh, from this paper by Ilaria and collaborators. Um, if you imagine that you have some um, ALP which couples only to tops, um, you know, sometimes when you're sort of model building, you, you make things couple only to the third generation because it makes them harder to see. That doesn't really work in the case of an axion-like particle. Um, I mean, for, for heavy ALPs, um, this is TV now. Um, uh, you're going to be able to see it in, um, in TT bar production. And you find these bounds. But as soon as you're light, um, you get this loop induced electron coupling, and then you get strong constraints from, um, from, you know, from the ALP electron coupling, um, which is generated through this top Yukawa effect. Uh, okay. Right. So, so, um, uh, so one important thing is that you, you sort of inevitably generate at some level, uh, quark flavor changing effects, um, through this running and this matching that, that, uh, I talked about once you get down to sort of scales where, uh, the ALP is in the sort of GV MEV range. Uh, and so just to be concrete about the numbers, this is the flavor off diagonal coupling. And if you start out with flavor universal couplings at lambda equals four pi TV. So, so this is, this is the scale at which the couplings are generated and they are always um, flavor diagonal and flavor universal. Um, you're going to get contributions um, from each of these types of couplings to this off diagonal thing. Um, you can see that it's small. There's 10 to the minus five here and there's um, the CKM elements. Um, but for anything with a top in, so here and here, you get some reasonable, um, some reasonable amounts. And of course, flavor changing measurements are, are very sensitive. Um, so this is still something that can be important. Um, so, so ALPs can, can produce a few different kinds of effects um, in quark flavor changing processes. Um, one is uh, from meson decays. Um, this, this is quite, you know, if they're light enough to be produced in meson decays, so K to pi alp or B to K or B to K star alp, um, then, you know, you can see it directly and you get these on-shell signatures, which depend on how the alp decays or doesn't. Um, and then it can also kind of just mediate, mediate things off-shell. Uh, like this or this, but but that's kind of a less striking signature and generally leads to less strong bounds. So by by sort of doing this kind of running from whatever couplings you start off with, um, you, you can calculate all of these observables in terms of the sort of fundamental Lagrangian coefficients that you, you picked at your high scale. Um, and you can put these flavor constraints on the same parameter space as other kind of more sort of I guess, classic uh, ALP constraints. Um, but first, to sort of understand these K on decays, I'm going to dive into um, chiral Lagrangians a little bit, um, which is the next few slides. Okay, so um, now we're down at the GV scale. Um, we've got U, D, and S quarks. Um, I'm putting them into a sort of triplet like this. Um, and now the general Lagrangian can be written um, 
uh, you know, can be written in terms of this sort of triplet coupling, left-handed, right-handed, etc. Um, and we want to match to a chiral Lagrangian written in terms of meson fields. Um, so uh, we can sort of do the kind of classic chiral Lagrangian procedure and sort of write all of the couplings as spherions. So this is just a rewriting of this, but now we've got scalar spherions, pseudoscalar, left-handed vector, right-handed vector, and these thetas. Um, and as long as we sort of are allowed to decide how these spurions uh, transform, then we can say that the whole Lagrangian has local um, chiral U3, U3L cross U3R invariants. Um, and then, and then the, the task becomes um, how to like write down the same uh, Lagrangian with the same symmetries in terms of the meson fields. Um, but in order to do that, it's convenient to rotate away the gluon coupling because um, uh, it's not obvious how that sort of matches. Um, and we can do that by just doing a sort of general chiral rotation um, with this kappa matrix. Um, and, and we can sort of choose any choice for the kappa matrix as long as its trace is one, and then it will work to kind of just rotate away the CGG. Um, and once we've done that, we now have these values of these spurions in terms of, you know, what we started off with, um, which has sort of pieces from the, the, the charge um, and, and also uh, ALP interactions. Now the R coefficient in front of um, the gluon term is zero, um, but we've also got a shifted photon term. Um, and finally, um, we're, we're at a stage where we can construct a chiral Lagrangian out of the meson octets. Um, we define a covariant derivative, which transforms the same way as this, um, as this sort of meson field. Um, and to do that, you need to sort of add in pieces proportional to the spurions. And the thing that happens here is that now we have a sort of ALP dependent piece in the covariant derivative because some of these spurions have pieces proportional to the ALP. Um, and then the sort of main part of the chiral Lagrangian is just written sort of, this is a sort of very standard way of writing it with the kinetic term and the uh, mass term. This coefficient overall is fixed by the pion mass. Uh, but both of these terms, now that we've sort of included the ALP, they both contain mass and kinetic mixing between the ALP and the neutral mesons. Um, and if we, if, we, if we care about like k to pi uh, decays, um, we also need a piece that, that sort of has the weak interactions in it. And this is the piece, um, uh, this is the sort of chiral version of that piece. Um, and it's got these, these sort of L fields, these L currents. And that's sort of defined as the thing that couples to the spurion L mu just by analogy to the fact that, you know, that's what that's what's involved in the in the weak interactions at the quark level. Um, this is the leading operator. There's also uh, a 27 plot operator, but it's suppressed. So we're just starting with this. Um, OK, so now we can see what what this is by going back to um, uh, back to the, the, the Lagrangian. And um, we have a piece that um, we have sort of various ALP dependent pieces in here now, including a piece from the ALP terms in the covariant derivative. Okay, so finally, we've got our Lagrangian and we can calculate the K to pi amplitude. Um, and there are now a lot of pieces that come through just this kind of weak interaction chiral, um, uh, chiral um, term, um, where the kind of the flavor change actually happens just through the weak interactions. And, um, and the ALP is just kind of there for the ride because it ends up being involved in this, um, in this Lagrangian term through the covariant derivative, et cetera. Um, but there's also a piece that, um, that is 
where the ALP itself uh, gives you the flavor change because the ALP has sort of quark level couplings to an S and to a D. Um, right, so, so then, you know, so then the overall picture is a sort of, is a sort of load of, um, load of essentially flavor diagonal ALP couplings that still give you this, um, this interaction and the flavor off diagonal ALP coupling. So what, the, what this means is that, um, um, is that even if you, even if you don't have any flavor change at the low scale, which as I've mentioned is unlikely, um, you can still uh, get a bound from this process on your action like particle um, uh, of, you know, tens of TeV if you, uh, if you assume it couples to gluons and quarks. But um, we can now also sort of take everything that we've done so far and, and translate it back to the high scale. Um, so, so take into account all of this running that you've had to do to get down to the, the sort of chiral perturbation theory scale. And then you get, um, you get sort of two kinds of pieces. You get one, which is flavor change via these, um, these sort of RG generated off diagonal interactions. And that's proportional to, um, to VTS, VTD, because that comes from the running involving the, um, the top Yukawa. But then you've also got this piece that's through the kind of low scale weak interactions, which is proportional to VUS, VUD. Um, and you can sort of compare. So, so each individual coupling ends up contributing to both of these. Um, so if you look at the um, coupling to SU2 gauge bosons, um, that ends up running into this off diagonal coupling and you get um, a, a coefficient of 0.1 here. Um, whereas, um, whereas the contribution that comes from, you know, it's still being kind of diagonal at the low scale is, is much smaller. Um, so even if you start off with a flavor conserving out model, um, the largest effects are often from ending up with a flavor non-conserving out model by the time you get down to the low scale. Um, and you can also look at the different mode, the neutral mode. Um, and in this case, um, your, your effect is proportional to the imaginary part. And so things change quite a lot. So the imaginary part of VTS, VTD is still of order VTS, VTD. Um, but the imaginary part um, for the kind of STUUD flavor change only comes through the CP violation um, term epsilon. So that's 10 to the minus three. So depending on which coupling you care about, you're going to get a different kind of um, ratio of effects in, in the charged and the neutral mode. Um, so you can sort of see how this works by looking at the constraints that you get. So if you are producing light alps in K to pi A, um, then they're either going to escape the detector or they're going to um, give you signatures like K to pi gamma gamma. gamma. Um, and so here are two scenarios, starting off with um, an ALP which um, uh, has only, only has couplings to SU2 gauge bosons at 4 pi TV, um, and another one that has couplings to gluons at 4 pi TV. And here, um, in this case, um, it's mostly through, uh, the, the effect is mostly through the running, um, giving you an explicit flavor change. Um, and so the ratio, between um, uh, the charged and the neutral modes that you can see here is determined by this ratio and also, of course, by the sensitivity of, of, of the experiments. Um, but you can compare it to this case where here you're relying on the, on the sort of standard model weak interactions to give you the effect. And so then you get a ratio which is proportional to this to epsilon. And then you see that there's a much bigger difference between the charged modes and the neutral modes. Um, so if you sort of, if you started to see ALPs in K on decays, then by looking at, at how much of an effect you see in the charged mode versus the neutral mode, 
you can get an idea of how the ALP actually couples at the high scale. Um, so this is a kind of um, uh, another constraint plot, but with but with more things on it, really. Um, so this is a scenario where you're assuming that at the high scale at four pi TV, um, uh, we're only coupling to SU two gauge bosons, um, and then we get this flavor change sort of through running and matching at one loop. Um, and it decays to uh, photons at tree level and to leptons at uh, loop level. Um, and uh, yeah, so you have the, the constraints from K on decays and, and at higher masses, um, you start to see it being produced in, in B decays, B to K, ALP to gamma gamma, et cetera. Um, and it's worth, mentioning that you know um if you have an alp that couples to photons then then sort of in the kind of s su2 invariant language that means um that it either has a coupling to su2 gauge bosons or to hypercharged gauge bosons or both um so you can think about both of these extreme cases and compare them to the photonic constraints so this is a kind of um, plot of the photonic constraints over a, a large range of masses for the ALP. Um, this is the photon coupling. It's a little bit cut off, but this is the photon coupling. Um, and you can see sort of um, familiar things like supernovas and, and horizontal branch stars, et cetera, and all the way up to like collider constraints. But you can see that sort of between like after the beam dump constraints and some of the astrophysical constraints, there's a bit of a gap. Um, so can flavor close this gap, assuming that it comes from a, um, yeah, assuming that it just comes from a sector that's above the electroweak scale. Um, so the best case scenario is if, is if this photon coupling is secretly an SU2 gauge boson coupling, uh, because then you can get flavor changes at one loop. And then you can see that your constraints fill in this gap um, quite well. Um, but even if you're in the kind of worst case scenario where, where all of your photon coupling is just a hypercharge coupling, um, you can still end up with flavor constraints that sort of end up um, putting some new constraints on this parameter space. Yes. So in, in these plots in particular, the one uh, that you mentioned on the very left-hand side with a lot of white space, how does the Higgs to ALP EK place in there? Because I know that, uh, I think even in that paper, there's also the pro projections for Higgs going to axion axion to photons, for instance, which covers that white area there. Uh, yeah, so that, kind of depends, I, I guess, on different couplings. So this is literally just the, the photon coupling. And would you assume a Higgs coupling or do you explicitly have to add it? I guess that's my so, question. Okay, so, so the, the, Higgs, the Higgs coupling does arise at one loop from this. So you can see um, here, so, okay, so on the right-hand side here, it's the same plot again, but compressed and in gray. Um, and over the top here are the, um, are the sort of branching ratios that you expect for, for Higgs to ALP ALP. Um, so this, it's a bit off center, but this like um, a solid red line is 10 to the minus three branching ratio. But, um, but these are just predictive branching ratios. I don't think um, that this is actually probed at all yet by, this, by the LHC. Thanks. Um, right. Okay. So, um, so yeah, what about leptons? Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about lepton flavor violating, um, ALPs. Um, so lepton flavor violation is a bit different because the standard model 
uh, doesn't violate lepton flavor. Uh, so if you start off with a lepton flavor conserving ALP, you're always going to have a lepton flavor conserving ALP. Um, but if you do have um, lepton flavor violating couplings, um, then, uh, then you can still get interesting interplay between lepton flavor violation and lepton flavor conserving uh, observables. So this is just a, a sort of example of that. So if you have this vertex where an ALP couples to a muon and an electron, then at one loop, it's going to give you contributions to um, G minus two of the muon and the electron. Um, so, and, and in any particular observable, um, what matters is generally not just what, what's the value of your uh, flavor of diagonal coupling, but also, you know, how does the ALP decay and, and what's the value of these, um, of these flavor conserving interactions. So if you, in this, in this plot, we're assuming that we have only leptonic couplings at tree level, um, and we're plotting the lepton flavor conserving couplings on the x-axis against the lepton flavor violating couplings to muon and electron on the y-axis. Um, and you see that for very low values of the lepton flavor conserving coupling, the ALP basically can't decay. It's got a very long decay, decay length, so it escapes the detector. So you get constraints from mu to e plus invisible, basically. Um, and you also get a constraint from muonium, which only depends on the, um, on the off diagonal uh, couplings. So this causes muonium anti muonium uh, oscillations. Uh, but as soon as you start to have larger diagonal couplings, then you can, you can get stronger constraints from things like mu to 3e. So the ALP is being created in mu to e ALP, and then it's decaying to two electrons promptly. Um, and you can also have like mu to e gamma gamma um, from the photon decay, which happens at one loop. Um, and if these things are sort of collinear and and within like they sort of fall within the resolution of your detector, um, then it can mimic mu to e gamma and you can get some constraints from that. Um, but for um, for lepton flavor violating ALPs, of course, um, it matters a lot uh, what the mass is because um, as soon as it can be produced on shell in muon decays, you get a kind of resonant enhancement to your process and, and you get much stronger constraints. Whereas if it's heavier than the muon, then everything has to be off shell and or at loop level. But you still can get constraints from mu to 3e e and mu to e gamma. Um, as I, as I said on the previous slide, all, nearly all of these um, bounds depend on the choice for the flavor conserving couplings and the flavor conserving couplings are strongly constrained in some regions of parameter space. Uh, so the, the coupling to electrons is, is uh, something, that, um, uh, something that should show up in a lot of places. Um, so these are the constraints. And so in each of these kind of regions, we've basically just made a choice that is consistent with these constraints. So here we've chosen that there are no flavor conserving couplings. Here we've chosen that the electron coupling is small, but the muon and the tau coupling can be anything. And here they're all equal to one for, um, I think for F is one TUV. Um, yeah, so the only thing, so, uh, yeah, so the only thing that doesn't depend on this choice is muonium anti muonium oscillations, because here you've really only got the off diagonal coupling. Okay, uh, yeah, so um, uh, quite an abrupt end, but this is my summary. Um, so yeah, action like particles are a generic option for light new physics. They're worth looking for just in case um, the heavy new physics has some, um, has some broken symmetry. Um, and if you use EFTs, you can sort of study them without particularly worrying what the UV completion is. Um, and, uh, and by running and matching from the UV scale, you generically get new couplings that create new phenomenology that you have to care about. Um, and flavor changing observables are a good place to look in the MEV to GUV mass range. Thank you.
Thank you for the great talk. And I'm, I'm glad it's very hard. Theory is very hard because the experiments are very hard. Yeah. Too. <laughs> Yeah, thank you indeed uh, for a very nice talk. Um, I, I just have a clarifying question for me. If if you go to the slide where you had this um, uh, chiral meson Lagrangian, where we're discussing the mixing. Uh, uh, that's right. That, that's right. I think. Yeah, I think there should be some hidden hidden assumption here because the, the, this Lagrangian also contains a term which is proportional to determinant sigma, which comes from the instant. I mean, omitting that term means that you don't generate the eta meson mass, okay? And that's what I was saying, actually. When, when you're rotating this, that yeah. axion will enter that term as well, which violates the shift symmetry. And, and not axion, but alp. But if you have another term also, which violates the symmetry, like you have the, the mass term, then those two symmetry violations won't be aligned. Okay, and that will regenerate you many other couplings as well. At least you have to be careful when, you know, in usual case, when there is no extra violation, we just redefine the field which enters this determinant and call this eta meson and then ignore it. But this is there. I mean, in, in your case, you have to be careful with this rotation. Okay, so there should be an extra term here. Yes, instead of that, because none of the whole determinants Okay. Oh, I didn't know there were stairs. Ah, very uh, oh, Thank you. It was a very interesting talk. Um, I was interested in the thing you were saying at the end about uh, the case where you have axion decays to two photons, but the two photons are essentially collinear. So it looks like one photon inside your detector. In principle, could you have another constraint, let's say for, for heavier axions where one of the photons is emitted in the backwards direction, but then it's essentially obscured inside your detector. Like if it's in a collider and you have some debris that's left over from whatever mechanism produced the muon, that photon might not be visible either. Uh, yes, I would guess so. I mean, so the reason that we sort of cared about this situation here is because the mu to e gamma constraints mm -hmm. are a lot stronger than the mu to e gamma gamma constraints. Like but if it, you just it... if you just look at them, no, I mean not not here, but if you look at them kind of on a you know on a sort of just kind of one dimensional bound level. Mm -hmm. So so um, so then there's the question of like, can we mimic mu to e gamma in order to get that? But but um. Uh, but it's going to depend on, on you know, the details of your experiment. Yeah, I, if, it, if it's collider, I'm not so sure because I don't know about colliders. But it seems like it's another way you could mimic this mu to e gamma, essentially. Um, yeah, no? but I think, I mean, in, in like, there's only one experiment looking for mu to e gamma. So, okay. like, it's not something, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm not sure about the production mechanism. We can talk. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. So when when one of the photons is emitted oppositely, it will not be not be obscured. It might be not detected because the energy is too low, but it will not be absorbed by by the debris or so. So that is at least in proton collisions, is that's transparent for photons. <laughs> Thank you. So it's from the PSI experiment, right? Um, Sorry. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, from the Meg, Meg experiment. That's right. Yeah. So then, yeah. as you just said, it's not an issue. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Any uh, comments, questions from Zoom? You still have time. Come on. <laughs> There was one question I had, kaons going to pi zero axion, does it depend on the axion mass that uh, decay rate? Um, yes, I mean, um, at some point, well, obviously it has to be lighter than the kaon mass yes, minus yes. the pion mass, but, but yeah, there will be some phase space. Um, Just phase space? Yes. Okay. 
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it depends on yes. 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 Great. Great. Well, Sophie, excellent talk. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you.